So lab one is going to be a red surf 32 lab. We're going to talk about what this technique is, uh, how you can detect it, and then we'll answer any questions at the end. So let me go ahead and jump into my lab VM. Should be seeing my desktop at this point. So brief overview. We want to make sure it's very clear that we give a shout out to the MITRE ATT&CK team that's developed this framework. Uh, we use this because we feel like it's a very extensive catalog of post-exploitation techniques. So this is certainly not something Red Canary has created, but we want to drive you guys to make sure you're aware of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And we're going to build our test case based on their published work. So we want to make sure you understand where the source of this information comes from. It's open, available for you to use, so we encourage you to, to check this out. Uh, afterwards. As far as Atomic Red Team tests go, where you can find this is on the Red Canary Atomic Red Team GitHub page. And this is here in the browser. You can browse to this. Uh, feel free to look at this as we go through this if you have questions. But what we've designed here is a way to take the MITRE framework and we've tried to align our test cases with the MITRE framework. So for example, if we wanted to look at a technique called the Red Serve 32, we could browse into the MITRE framework go into the execution tab, or we can browse down to where the actual Red Serve 32 event is and look at the details for this particular attack. You'll notice it falls into two different uh, tactics, a defensive uh, evasion and execution. So we can click on that. We can see all the details. Everything you'd want to know is really nicely, succinctly cataloged here uh, on the MITRE attack page. Now, how would we actually map this in the atomic framework? So again, our catalog follows the same flow, so you would go into Windows. We could then browse into the Execution tab, and then we could take a look at the technique that we're looking at, and you'll find Red Serve 32 here. We have some cross mappings, so if you're curious about how that works, you want to go back to the framework, you can do that here. And we've tried to provide a very brief overview of what the test case is, and then we've provided sample scripts on how to actually execute the test. And that's what an atomic test is, really distilled down to very simply, what the technique is, and how do you test it to seed your logs and make sure your detections are actually working. Because that's really the goal of this, is to make sure that whatever tool or um, software you're using to detect attacks in your environment, if you run an attack, you want to make sure that your telemetry is being collected and analyzed properly. So with that, we'll go ahead and get into one of the atomic tests. And so the first one we're calling Lab 1. It's just a basic RedServe32 lab. All of these scripts will be published on the Git repo uh, after this, so you don't have to recreate this. But in all honesty, they're just batch files. So we're just keeping it very basic at this point. So we think you should be able to create these pretty easily. In this lab, we're going to go back to the test case, and we've got a payload here called redserve32.sct. I'll talk about what an SCT file is in just a minute, but if I bring up the payload that we're actually going to test, you can see some details about the attack, but ultimately here on line 18, we're just gonna be running calc. And all of this is fully customizable for you guys to run something or chain things together, which we'll get into in lab two. Okay, so on with the attack. This has become fairly popular attack technique over the last year. Uh, let's break this down of what's happening. So RedSurf32 is a default tool inside of Windows. So it's been with Windows since like Windows XP all the way through to Windows 10. So we're going to use this command to actually execute a payload from the internet. And that's why this is really attractive. It, it works as both a application whitelisting bypass or uh, other endpoint telemetry bypass. Uh, hopefully you're catching this, but we want to make sure that you're able to test your log with these atomic tests. So RedSurf32 is the binary. Go ahead, Mike. Out of I was going to say, out of curiosity, Casey, how did you end up coming across this sort of on your own in the wild? How are you reviewing to get to this place? Oh, sure. So just some background. Yeah, good question. So some of you may or may not be aware. This is a technique uh, that I blogged about about a year ago uh, and just, just found a way to execute something remotely in an environment that was pretty locked down with whitelisting, and I wanted to be able to execute a script. Uh, and so I came across this just looking at some of the default binaries that were available and, and found that you can register a comm scriptlet using this tool, uh, even though that's really not your objective. Your end goal would be to execute some command or payload. But that, this, this tool uh, really surfaced as a really nice way for, as a red teamer at the time I was working on, uh, as a way to evade some of the uh, defensive techniques that I was going up against, if that makes sense. 
Awesome. That's awesome. Yep. So yeah, just to kind of continue on, so slash s is suppressing any error messages. So we're going to hide uh, anything that may be popping up or prompting the user that there was an error. Slash u is actually a really interesting part of this attack because what this is saying is when we run this command, unregister the code that's in the scriptlet. So if you look at the payload here, you can see that there's a registration block. And that falls between like line 22 and line 3. And so whatever falls in here, you're telling RedSurf32, unregister this thing. And the reason that's attractive for uh, attackers is because it doesn't leave any artifacts in the registry. It doesn't leave anything um, registered on disk. It will leave the temporary file downloaded, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this is kind of nice because uh, it lets you run something without actually putting, uh, a, you know, sort of tattooing the registry or persisting in the machine in some method. So um, the, next, the next command is slash i. And slash i is simply a parameter to RedServe32. And this is where we actually pass the URL that we want to be executing uh, into the system. And then at the very end, we have the DLL, scrobga.dll, which is going to be essentially think of this like a scripting environment or script host. This is the thing that's really going to do the execution for us or the heavy lifting. So this is a common attack. Uh, all of these different variables then are going to generate telemetry in your network. So you're going to have things like command line arguments you could look for, like slash s, slash u, slash i. You may be looking for scrobj on the command line, you may be looking for an SCT file, although be aware this extension doesn't really matter. It could be anything. We've seen JPEG or PNG. What actually matters is that the payload over here is a properly structured XML document. Okay. So, so Casey, this yep. this can go both ways, right? We could we could run this SCT file locally and on the network side, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, the, you know, a sim simple way to run this if you wanted to, uh, if you had, uh, let's say you had an SCT local, let's say I down, so in this, in this screenshot I've downloaded the atomic repo and I go to execution and, or actually rather payload, sorry, and I've got an SCT file here. You could actually right click and just say unregister. I'll just do it. <laughs> Why not? Now, It'll pop a message and pop calc, but that's why the attackers like the slash s. They don't want that to show up, and so then we get the payload. So it certainly could be run locally or uh, off of a network share. That's exactly right. That's awesome. So again, one of the things we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and run this test, and then we're going to look at and confirm that our tele endpoint telemetry collection is actually seeing uh, these events. So let's go ahead and just run it. Like I said. These are all just batch files, so I could copy and paste, or in this example, I'm just going to go ahead and run the Red Canary Labs 1 bat file that contains the very basic atomic test. Red Sur 32 reaches out to the internet, calc pops, crowd goes wild. Um, but let's dive in and see what actually happened uh, in our log collection when this attack was generated, if that makes sense. Casey, before we hop into that, we got one pretty good question here. I'll, I'll run yeah, past right. Yep. Um, so why would you unregister and not register it? Okay, good question. So yeah, this is something I dove into when I was researching this method. Uh, if you actually register that scriptlet, it, it's actually going to create registry keys that that a defender could come along and pick up. So the really the really amazing thing that I think that when I found this was that by putting the slash u command on the command line. It says I want to unregister, even though it doesn't live on the machine, but it will execute the code thinking there's something you want to execute there that you need to unregister. So uh, hopefully that helps to answer the question. But yeah, it's a really good question. Like, I'm not unregistering anything. I'm actually just using that to gain a, a path into the uh, XML file to execute the code. Uh, hopefully that helps to answer the question. And um, if I need to follow up on that, I can later. So. Awesome. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then on, as you're loading up the event log there, yeah. um, are there other types of, of DLLs that you can run with RedServe32? So you got ScrubJ there. Is there is there anything else that can kind of run off the end right there? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I've certainly seen um, – so the, the way the, the attack actually works is you're, you're actually passing slash I into whatever DLL that you're running. And so um, – I think I, I think I actually bookmarked this mic. Hold on one second. So if you look at like slash these parameters that are passed to RedServe32, slash i is just calling 
a DLL install method inside of your DLL. So if you created a specially crafted DLL and then pass slash I, you could pass whatever parameters you want. Uh, and uh, the drawback to that from an attacker perspective means you'd have to leave your custom DLL on disk and uh, you know, uh, there's, there's risk there, but certainly there's, there's other attackers using other DLLs that have different payloads, if that answers the question. Does that make sense? Yep, that's perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a bunch of events. In this example, we're just using uh, Sysmon. Mike's going to go into a little detail of, of some other tools that we can use, but uh, a lot of people use Sysmon. This, again, is not a Red Canary tool. This is a Microsoft tool. This is from the Sys internal suite. And we can see there's a bunch of different uh, activity occurring here. And so and as far as running an atomic test, I want to see where did Red Serve 32 actually execute. And I can see a couple of different artifacts that then would be interesting to me as a defender. Uh, I can see Red Serve 32 ran, and I can see that it actually made a network connection. And if we look down here at the bottom pane, we can see that it called out to this IP address over this port using HTTPS. So uh, that's pretty interesting right there, that Red Serve 32 making a network connection. How often does that happen in your environment? And if we drill down a little bit, I think this is the right one, the yeah, 1113, you can actually see the command line that was executed, and you can also see a parent process. And so that could be important. Maybe the parent process was like Microsoft Word or Excel uh, or some other tool. So uh, at, at this point, uh, what I would say is the, you know, the atomic test here for lab one is really complete. We've executed the test. We've seen everything that we executed in the batch file has shown up in our log collection. Uh, at this point, uh, we've completed the steps that we would need for lab one. So uh, hopefully that's helpful information. At this point, I want to pause for just a minute and see if anybody might have any questions on what we just did there. Yeah, so we, we do have one question here, Casey, um, which I think we, we just talked about this, I think, yesterday, or not yesterday, but last week. was uh, So kind of what is the, how is RedServe32 when you're loading this with SCR object, uh, SCR object? Scrub J or squibbly do. <laughs> um, how is it different from run DLL 32? Oh, okay, so that's actually uh, probably something we would I'd want to address a little bit later. Um, but just the, the short answer would be uh, run DLL 32. You specify when you call run DLL 32, you specify the DLL that you're running, uh, the method that you're calling, and then any parameters that you want to pass. You can actually run scriptlets from run DLL 32 using a function called get object. But I'll tell you what I'll do, Mike. I'll let me, uh, it's a good question, and uh, we don't have time now to do that, but let me, let me follow up with that in the uh, follow up email so we have the details of why RedSurf 32 is different than run DLL 32. And it's actually, I'll probably drive you back to also the MITRE framework. Again, this framework has some good distinctions about different techniques. And so if we look in the MITRE framework, there's actually some additional detail on, you know, here's RedServe32, but here's some additional details about RunDLL32 that you may want to reference as a starting point to find additional information. Yeah, I believe That's we also question. have, uh, I believe we also have a couple atomic tests for RunDLL as well. We certainly, yeah, we do. We have some atomic tests that map to that technique for sure. Yep, a uh, couple, okay, so we got a few systems oh, okay, on yep. um, so the EVTX for Sysmon, uh, when you do install it, it loads it into uh, Windows Event Viewer there. Or, or I believe it does, right? Kaser, do you have to go and pull it in through MMC? Into uh, it, it, no, that's a good question. So um, it did actually, uh, I didn't have to do anything different with Event Viewer. Once Sysmon's installed, the operational logs are available to you there. Uh, and if you wanted to see location of where those logs actually persist, uh, you can see the log path and the log name on properties. Uh, there's some probably some additional configuration for that. I'm not I'm not too familiar with that at this point, but hopefully that helps you see. Like I didn't do anything different with Event Viewer to bring that log window up. If that was the question. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, and then do you do you know? I I don't know if we dug into this enough, but uh, in any other security event logs, just like in the security one. Um, is there anything else within there when we execute Red Surf 32 like this that uh, would trigger some kind of event uh, that we could potentially correlate with Sysmon? That's a good question. I'm not familiar with that. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you know that, Mike. I haven't seen anything in any other logs at this point. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if there's an error. There may be something in the application log, but I'm speculating on that. I, 
I, I think that's a good question yeah. to follow up on if we could identify yeah. other uh, areas where Sysmon may or other logs that have artifacts for RedSurf32. That's a great question, actually. So the, there's one question that came in. Is there a big difference when trying to detect this via Sysmon versus EDR solutions? Um, it it kind of goes both ways. You can use Sysmon as a way to um, audit these type of events, right, and drop them into a sim and review them or use Windows event forwarding to centralize that logging. Uh, then you can hunt through Sysmon data that way. Uh, or if you're using an EDR solution, right, you have similar abilities and capabilities to also create watch lists or some kind of feeds looking for different command variables within that command line, um, or red serve making a netcon or red serve going to a gist. Um, that's actually one of my favorite ways to catch catch Casey is looking for uh, command line activity going to GitHub. <laughs> But awesome. uh, yeah, there's definitely kind of multiple ways to do it with, with both of these products. And that's one of the reasons why we highlighted this one today. Great. Good. Yeah, really good. Some really good questions. So it looks like there's some follow-up on maybe some event codes. We'll, we'll get that uh, out to everybody to make sure we're uh, getting you guys the right info. So thanks for the feedback on that. Really good.